power. He loves the ability to manipulate and control people. Why? Most likely because he was victimized by his mentor who loved to control people. And his mentor was Andre Lorel. Tell, tell us how he was he mentored about? by Clyde Davis. This is the money. That's the money guy. That's where Diddy was getting all of his funds from. A new lawsuit just came out that shows tons of evidence that P. Diddy, Puff Daddy, has been running a sexual blackmail operation very much like Jeffrey Epstein, but in the rap and music industry for basically 30 years. And in that lawsuit, we learned that his head of security while he's running the sexual blackmail ring is this guy named Fahim Muhammad, who before working for Diddy was the head of security for Michael Jackson when he was only 21. Y'all, so it looks like Jaguar Wright is still not done spilling all the tea on Diddy or Honeycomb, as she prefers to call him. And this time she's bringing some shocking new details about Diddy's relationship with his alleged sugar daddies, Mr. Clive Davis and Ron Barco. Now this is not the first time that we're hearing about these two and how they allegedly helped Diddy cover up all types of illegal activities. And rumor has it that that in exchange, Diddy did some, well, let's say favors for his mentors. Now, rumor has it, allegedly, Diddy got on his knees for Clive Davis in 1994, and that's how Bad Boy Records came about. But y'all, after Diddy was recently slapped with a new lawsuit by Rodney and Lil Rod Jones, Diddy's fifth case since November, internet sleuths discovered some pretty well connections between people who allegedly helped Diddy run what Lil Rod referred to as a criminal enterprise. Yes, there are definitely all kinds of bizarre coincidences between people mentioned in Lil Rod's lawsuit and Diddy's rumored relationships with his powerful sugar daddies and i'm talking claims about whitney houston and michael jackson's deaths allegations of a widespread blackmail ring and all types of other absolutely mind-blowing details now there are definitely a little small amount of people that dismissed jaguar white when she first started speaking about diddy and other industry heavyweights but y'all it's starting to look like she was spot on about most of these things but y'all there is a whole lot to unpack here so let's get into it y'all if you'll take the money once you'll take the money twice if you take the money twice you'll take the money three times you know and once they get used to getting that money now you've given the other person all of the control Okay, let's start with Diddy's rumored sugar daddy number one, Clive Davis. The grapevine has been buzzing for a while now that rumors that Clive Davis played fairy godparent to bad boy, but not out of sheer generosity, but allegedly because Diddy supposedly stepped into the shoes of Andre Harrell as Clive's, shall we say, special companion. Clive Davis is over Arista, which is over Diddy's bad boy record. Now, rumor has it, allegedly, Diddy got on his knees for Clive Davis in 1994, and that's how Bad Boy Records came about. Yes, the rumor mill has been churning about some spicy tidbits from the same blind item, suggesting that Diddy and Clive Davis share more than just industry ties. Now brace yourselves, they shaking the table out here, and it's about to get scandalous. Both of them have faced some sordid allegations, and if that wasn't bad enough, a bunch of folks who worked with them ended up meeting mysterious ends. Now let's talk about Clive and his long-lasting conspiracy that has been swirling around him like a storm cloud. Some folks believe that he might have had a hand in Whitney Houston's tragic demise and that Diddy allegedly helped him cover it up. On February 11, 2012, Whitney was found lifeless in her bathtub at the Beverly Hilton Hotel, the very place where Clive was gearing up for his pre-Grammys party, or some would say pre-Grammys ritual. Now here's where it gets downright eyebrow raising. Instead of canceling the party when he got the news of Whitney's passing, Clive decided to go full steam ahead. And of of course, some people couldn't wrap their heads around how Clive and other celebs would be popping bottles and dancing while Whitney's lifeless body lay upstairs. According to CBS News, Houston's body remained in the hotel rooms hours after emergency responders pronounced her dead. Downstairs, Davis's extravagant party went on as planned as investigators roamed the hotel lobby and women wearing designer ball gowns and men dressed in tuxedos shuffled by towards the red carpet. And then there's this other article stating that 
Whitney remained in state, so to speak, in her fourth floor suite, and she was not removed until just moments before the party ended at a little after midnight. So after this whole whirlwind of Whitney's passing, Clive tried to do some damage control and claimed that he didn't cancel the party at the Beverly Hilton because it was meant to be a tribute to Whitney. Oh, and he also said that that's what Whitney would have wanted. Why did you let the party go on? Of course, this is a personal thing, but the Grammys for the next night, you don't cancel. You turn an evening into a tribute. You oh, you did a magnificent evening. Evening into... Did you give a thought to canceling? Never. You never thought? Never. Could never. you, did you ever think... I know, the family did not want me to give a thought didn't. to can't No. No. But hold on, wait a minute. Some of Whitney's longtime friends, including Shaka Khan, Shaka Khan, threw some major shade at Clive, saying his decision to go with the party was nothing short of insanity. And according to Shaka Khan, it was the complete opposite of what Whitney would have wanted. You were, I think, going to go to the Clive Davis party. Yes. It was a surreal event where Whitney's body was still in the hotel, and there was this sort of party where apparently half the room were in tears, the other half were kind of partying. What did you feel about that? I thought that was complete insanity. Um, and knowing Whitney, I don't believe that she would have said, the show must go on. She's the, she's the kind of woman that would say, stop everything. Uh-uh. I'm not going to be there. You know? Um, I don't know what could motivate a person to have a party in a building where the person whose life he had influenced so, so enormously and whose life had been affected by her, sort of, they, they, they were like, I don't understand how that part of I mean, A true tribute, you know, might have been a truer, a more honest tribute from, in my, you know, in my opinion, would have been maybe call everybody together, let's say a prayer, and um, let's eat dinner and go home. What is your, I, what I just, is? I couldn't get dressed. I was supposed to go to the party. I just got off a plane from Miami at about 5.30. When I, as soon as I hit the, the tarmac, I found out, I, I heard, and I couldn't get, I couldn't put on makeup. I couldn't get dressed. I, I couldn't do anything. I was paralyzed. I, I couldn't do anything. But y'all, we are definitely not done. We just scratching the surface here. So get this, just 48 hours before Whitney's tragic death, she crashed an interview with Brandy, Monica, and Clive Davis, and she discreetly slipped a mysterious note to Brandy. But that's not all, folks. Pay close attention to how Whitney said not once, but twice, I nearly drowned today. <laughs> Now, as for the details of Whitney's cause of death, according to LA County Coroner's Office, her cause was a combination of drowning, heart disease, and substance use. But here's where it gets even stranger. The autopsy report threw in a curveball by mentioning external trauma on Whitney's body, and yet the coroner dismissed any suspicions of foul play. However, private investigator Paul Hubel later challenged the official ruling, alleging that Whitney had defense wounds on her body. And when Jaguar Wright joined the had an echo the same sentiment according to her, Whitney's family claimed to have seen marks on her body and looked like she had been in a struggle. Her, she was beat. They saw her body. She didn't just die in a tub, like she was beat. Okay, so now let's connect all these dots and dive into Diddy's angle of this whole Clive and Whitney situation. So what a lot of people don't know is that Diddy made an appearance at Clive Davis's Grammy party on the very night Whitney died, and Clive picked Diddy to give a speech about Whitney, despite the fact that the venue was full of people who were actual friends of Whitney. Now fast forward a few days, and what do we have? Diddy finds himself in the hot seat on The Ellen Show, looking like a cat on a hot tin roof. When Ellen starts poking around about the party and that speech he gave. I know that you were the first, uh, one of the first ones at Clive's party to speak about Whitney's mm -hmm. passing the other day. Yes. And uh, that, it, that was, um, did you know her well? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. um, the years I got to meet her, she was so full of life, so full of just joy. And um, it, it, she, she, she always made you feel like she was, she noticed you and recognized you and spoke to you. And she, she'll definitely, truly be missed. Yeah. 
She will, I agree. But wait, did y'all see that lightning speed at which Diddy swooped down for the mug that second Ellen mentioned Clive's party? I mean, you gotta admit it's pretty strange that Clive chose Diddy of all people to give a speech at the party right after Whitney's passing because Whitney and Diddy were not besties. And Diddy is not exactly very eloquent, obviously. In fact, Diddy was much closer to Bobby Brown, the same guy who openly admitted to putting hands on Whitney during their relationship. But in a bizarre twist, when BET handed Diddy a Lifetime Achievement Award last year, he went ahead and gave a shout out to Bobby Brown in his acceptance speech. And, and, and this is a special personal one for me. I gotta thank the king, Bobby Brown. He, yeah, get up for Bobby Brown, y'all. Yeah, come on. Hey, yo, he was the first chocolate boy wonder. He gave me a lot of confidence. Sometimes you don't know the people you touch. Bobby, you touch me and I love you. Give it up for Bobby Brown, y'all. But there's more, y'all. According to an Entertainment Weekly article, the morning after Whitney died, Diddy ended up in a hospital with a severe migraine after hosting another wild post-Grammy party at the Playboy Mansion. However, Whitney's death is not the only tragic event in Hollywood that sparked numerous conspiracy theories with Clive Davis and Diddy being at the center. There's also this new viral theory on how Diddy hired people who might have been involved in the death of none other than the king of pop, Michael Jackson. Now, everybody knows that Diddy was recently hit with a yet another lawsuit, this time by a male producer who worked on his love album, Rodney Little Rod Jones. Now Rodney accused Diddy of a bunch of depravities, and if you read the lawsuit, then you know the allegations are absolutely vile. However, what sets this lawsuit apart from the previous ones is that Little Rod filed it under the RICO Act, alleging that Diddy and his various accomplices have been running a large-scale criminal enterprise. Now speaking of Diddy's alleged accomplices, one one name that stood out in the lawsuit is that of Fahim Muhammad, Diddy's head of security, who according to Little Rod, has close ties with law enforcement. The lawsuit states, Mr. Combs made it clear that his head of security, Fahim Muhammad, had the power to make people and problems disappear. Mr. Combs instructs his staff to always contact Mr. Muhammad if they are ever pulled over by the police in Miami or California. According to Little Rod's lawsuit, Diddy's group of alleged accomplices included many high-profile people from the music industry, and they all helped to conceal the venture's existence by providing the cash necessary for the venture to avoid leaving a visible paper trail. The lawsuit further claims that Diddy's powerful friends employed and empowered Fahim Muhammad and Diddy's chief of staff, Christina Koram, to pay off law enforcement and to compensate the S workers with cash. Now, if you're wondering what the heck does all this have to do with the king of power, well, here's where it gets real crazy. So it turns out that Fahim Muhammad was chief of the Michael Jackson security team, and he was present the night that MJ died. In fact, he was the second on scene after Dr. Conrad Murray. Fahim later testified during Dr. Murray's trial, and that's when he revealed that he was hired as MJ's chief of security just 10 months before MJ's death. At that point in time, how long did you work security for Mr. Jackson? Approximately... 10 months. And what were your responsibilities? I was the chief of his security, so uh, my responsibilities ranged from making sure his house was protected, making sure his children were protected, and making sure his day-to-day -day activities and movement was all safe and planned and mapped out. Now, if you're wondering how on earth this young man, who looked like he was fresh out of college, became not just one of MJ's bodyguards, but chief of security, well, prepare your mind to be blown. Apparently, Fahim was fresh out of college when he was hired to work for MJ. Most recent articles about Fahim's list his age at 35 in 2023, which means that at the time of MJ's death in 2009, he was 20 or 21. So you mean to tell me that the Michael Jackson decided to hire a 20-year-old old kid to be his chief of security? Well, not quite. See, according to social media user Ian Carroll, who recently went viral for his deep dive into all this mess, someone else might have hired Fahim on behalf of Michael, and those same people might also have ties with Diddy. So check this out. And yes, Jackson did say that the Jews are we're probably referring to the Jews in the music industry are like leeches and that they took everything from them and that they did it on purpose. But when you look into those allegations or those insults, you realize that because of his will that was probably fake and filed right before his death, 
So the will was signed on July 7th in Los Angeles by three witnesses. But Jackson's family pointed out that he was in New York that day and there's video proving it. So they changed their story, but the witnesses definitely saw it and it was just in New York. So anyways, because of this will, John Branca was put in charge of his estate, which included his net worth of 230 million, but far more importantly, his 50% share of Sony ATV worth 750 million. Yes, he was taking on Sony. He was going after the hand that feeds him. And when you look into John Bronca, in 2003, Jackson fired Bronca because he was siphoning money out of Jackson's accounts in collusion with Sony Music CEO, Tommy Mottola, and funneling it through a bunch of offshore accounts in the Caribbean. John Bronca is Jewish, and Tommy Mottola is also Jewish. Plus, Tommy Mottola married Mariah Carey partway through his life when she was a young, young woman. He was an old man. And there are other allegations about that whole situation you can look up on your own. In the first video I made about the Diddy case where I broke down the whole thing, I went through a whole bunch of music executives that are involved in that case or that come about when you start looking into it. And every single person that I showed in that video that was not black was Jewish. Because whether you like it or not, whether you wanna call people names about it or not, the vast majority of the power in the music industry is controlled by Jewish men. For most of Jackson's career, his head of security was Bill Bray, who was his mentor and basically his father. And the two were extremely close. Bill ran his security until he was 70 when he retired, and Jackson continued to pay his medical bills until he died at age 80. This is a letter that Michael Jackson wrote to Bill that is both really touching and really enlightens you as to the state of Michael Jackson's education and his perspective on the world and his life story. Pause if you want to read that. But then once Bill retired, Jackson was then protected by other security people that came and went. And he wound up with this guy who has direct connections to Diddy's sexual blackmail operations, who was directly complicit in covering up crimes for Diddy and covering up murders, covering up drug use, prostitution, human trafficking. This is the guy that was protecting Michael Jackson the day that he died. The day that he was overdosed on drugs after he was probably already asleep and the only witnesses, there, there were no witnesses to the crime. I'm honestly kind of surprised that this guy never got checked into as a suspect. I suggest you re-examine the story of Michael Jackson and you re-listen to some of his lyrics. I bet if I include the song, they'll take the video down for copyright as a way to silence this video, but you should probably re-listen to the lyrics for They Don't Really Care About Us. And if you find the censored version, you should probably find out what the words that they censored are. So basically, according to Ian, Fahim Muhammad might be yet another celebrity handler hired by the industry higher-ups to keep his celebrity client in check. You know, the same thing Kanye claimed about his personal trainer, Harley Pasternick, who threatened to institutionalize him. I was looking up Fahim, and where did I find another article about him? on Penn State, the Wharton School. He didn't attend it as a student, he was invited as a speaker um, for this Wharton real estate entrepreneurship event. Which makes perfect sense, he has a real estate investment company or whatever, but if you've been following along, you would know that the Wharton School comes up an awful lot when we're talking about intelligence agencies and people associated with the CIA and the FBI, etc. Just thought it was interesting that they invited him to be a uh, honored speaker at their event. And now here's the best part, check this out. In This is in all of his bios, by the way, but we're pointing it out now. In 2008, Fahim graduated from Sacramento State University with a bachelor's of science degree in business administration with a concentration in real estate and marketing, okay? Do you realize what's wrong with that yet? Anything coming to mind? When did Michael Jackson die? June 25th, 2009, Jackson died from cardiac arrest caused by a propofol and benzodiazepine overdose, caused by his doctor apparently. Um, hold up, hold the phone, pause. Why is a dude who just graduated college last year with a business and real estate degree, the head of security for the king of pop, for Michael Jackson, the most famous musician of all time. 
What's going on? Now we know that MJ absolutely despised Sony and was openly critical of their alleged shady business practices. In fact, he once held up a sign saying, Sony kills, and he referred to Tommy Mottola as the devil. I've generated several billion dollars for Sony, several billion. And um, they, they really thought that my mind is always on music and dancing and, and, I, and it usually is, but they never thought that this performer myself would outthink them. Yeah! I own half of Sony's publishing and, and I'm leaving them and they, they're very angry at me because of it, but um, I just... And Tommy Mottola is a devil. So Tony Mottola was the head of Sony Music until January 2003, and shortly after he left, the Bertelsmann Music Group, the parent company of Clive Davis's Arista Records, merged with Sony Music. Then fast forward to 2008, about a year before Michael Jackson's death, and Clive Davis was named Chief Creative Officer for all of Sony Music Entertainment. So are all these connections between different people working for Diddy and Clive Davis pure coincidence? Well, it's up to you to see what you want to see and believe what you want to believe. However, word on the streets is that Clive Davis had a thing going on with Diddy for years, as in they were allegedly more than friends, if you catch my drift. Now the rumor mill is in overdrive, speculating that there's a cover up in the works and some folks are saying that Diddy and Clive are playing a game of mutual protection. On one hand, Diddy might be shielding Clive from any whispers of alleged involvement in the deaths of Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, and possibly some other artists who left us too soon. But on the flip side, Clive might be returning the favor by helping Diddy get away with all of his alleged wrongdoings. Of course, neither Clive nor Diddy ever admitted to being anything more than a mentor and a mentee. However, back in 2013, Clive decided to break the silence and came out as bisexual. And it wasn't just a casual revelation. He spilled the tea in an interview with Pierce Morgan, admitting that he had several relationships with men in the past. Personal life, you got married twice to women, but as you're very honest in the book about, you're bisexual and you've been involved in two lengthy relationships with men, including one now. What has been the reaction to these revelations in the book and have you been surprised by it? I've not been surprised, honestly, but uh, firstly, from my family, from my children who've known, this wasn't that I was bisexual when I was married. Mm. This is something that only occurred after my second marriage failed. Mm. So for the first time, having failed in marriage twice, not related at all to sex, mm. I open myself up to the possibility of having a relationship with a person rather than a gender. And that's what I turned to. But I found that the attitude in general towards bisexuality is you're either gay, you're straight, or you're lying. Right. For me, it's not been that case. And here comes Jaguar Wright entering the chat. According to Jaguar, it seems like Diddy's been caught up in some very shady businesses, allegedly involved in some not so pleasant activities, like pressuring young people into compromising situations and moving them between cities and states for these purposes. And get this, according to Jaguar, the reason Diddy has been skating away scot-free for so long is because he's got some powerful connections in the industry, including the likes of Clive Davis, who's allegedly in the same boat. Jaguar dropped a bombshell, suggesting that Diddy might have picked up these unsavory skills from his late mentor, Andre Harrell, and big wig behind Uptown Records. And Andre supposedly learned the ropes from none other than Clive himself. My focus right now is Sean Combs. Okay, tell us why, tell us why. Because he's a sex trafficker. Okay. And he's using music and entertainment to sex traffic. Now, is this, is this just boys, girls, adults, kids? Like it I mean, from what I've heard from sources that I would consider reliable, it really doesn't matter. Wow. Um, I don't think sexuality is something that has anything to do with gender at this point for Sean. I, I honestly think he's just an extreme narcissist who loves power. He loves the ability to manipulate and control people. Why? Most likely because he was victimized by his mentor who loved to control people. 
and his mentor was Andre uh, Well. Tell tell us how he was, was mentored by Clyde Davis. Jaguar also spilled tea on how back in the day, Andre Harrell gave Diddy the boot from Uptown Records in 1993. And just two weeks later, Diddy managed to bounce back like a champ and launched his own label, Bad Boy Records, which didn't just compete with Uptown, but straight up left it in the dust. And back in 2019, Diddy actually acknowledged that it was Clive Davis and Arista Records who helped him bounce back after Andre dropped him. Diddy shared a tribute to Clive on his Facebook page saying, Clive Davis and Arista Records gave me a chance when I was starting Bad Boy Entertainment and he was one of the first industry executives to really believe in me. I'm forever grateful for him. Now back to Jaguar. She also confirmed this saying that the speedy rise of Diddy's Bad Boy empire wasn't just luck and that it allegedly involved some behind the scenes favors for none other than Clive Davis. What I do know is that Andre got passed over. Like how do you go from being the president of Uptown and losing your entire company to your intern. Like Puff started out as an intern. But Jaguar didn't stop there, of course not. She also suggested that Clive might have played a part in helping Diddy sweep the pretty dark incident under the rug. Back in 1991, during a charity basketball game organized by Diddy, tragedy struck. A stampede resulted in the loss of nine young lives. And among the victims was pregnant girlfriend of rapper Father MC, who happened to be signed to Uptown Records. Diddy, of course, denied responsibility for the tragic incident, but word on the street from various sources is that the whole event was a ticking time bomb. The place was apparently overbooked and Diddy reportedly turned a deaf ear to his security warnings about the potential for a disaster. So Jaguar hinted that Clive may have lent a helping hand in hushing up the aftermath of this city college incident. He listened to all of his advisors, mostly Clive Davis, and he won. Like he was determined to win. Like nobody knew how determined he was to win. Like that whole thing with Father MC, he covered that thing up real fast. He didn't have proper security, he didn't have proper permit, and there was a stampede and Father MC's woman got uh, trampled to death. But then why was Clive doing all these favors for Diddy? Do you think that he just helped him out the kindness of his heart and asked for nothing in return? Let me know what you think about that in the comments. But now we gotta talk about Diddy's rumored sugar daddy number two. While Diddy's connection to Clive Davis isn't exactly news, few people know anything about this shadowy figure who allegedly played an important role in helping Diddy get away with all these types of messed up activities. His name is Ronald Ron Burkle, a billionaire investor and one of the richest people in the world. As of 2024, Burkle's net worth is estimated at $2 billion. But unlike Clive Davis, Ron Burkle is not part of the entertainment world. So for most people, his name really doesn't ring a bell. However, back in 2003, Ron did make some headlines in celebrity news magazines when it was reported that he invested a whopping $100 million in Diddy's clothing company, Sean John. In fact, this article published by WWD in September 2003 starts off by saying, Sean P. Diddy Combs has a sugar daddy. WWD has learned that Combs signed a financing deal aimed at turning Sean John into a billion dollar label. So what made Ron Burkle invest $100 million in Diddy's company that wasn't even doing that great? He just decided to put his money on the line and help Diddy without asking for anything in return? Now we all know better than that. Well, social media has been buzzing that Ron might have replaced Clive Davis as Diddy's special friend, if you know what I mean. After all, Clive is approaching 100 years old, so it's unlikely that he's been getting busy at these freak-offs. Now, when it comes to Ron Burkle, though, there's been a lot of controversy attached to his name over the years. Most recently, in January 2020, Ron's 27-year-old son, Andrew Burkle, was found dead in his Beverly Hills home, and the family refused to disclose what happened. It also appears that Andrew was close to Diddy's sons because Quincy shared a tribute to Andrew on Instagram and revealed that he was meant to have lunch with him the following day. Quincy took to his IG stories to share a screenshot of his conversation with Andrew and another friend, showing their plans to meet up for lunch. Andrew messaged Quincy saying, yo, what's up, Q? And then the other friend wrote, let's all link Tuesday, catch lunch, and discuss a plan of action. Quincy then texts back, done, done, and done. However, the meetup never happened and Andrew's lifeless body was discovered 
heartbreak less than 24 hours later. Quincy wrote on his story, we're supposed to be together right now, talking genius things 2020. This hurt, true friend. You will be missed, Andrew. Rest in paradise. But wait, there's another bizarre coincidence connecting Ron Burkle, Diddy, and Michael Jackson's former chief of security, who now works for Diddy. Guess who bought MJ's iconic Neverland Ranch after Michael Jackson passed? That's right, Diddy's buddy Ron Burkle. According to the New York Times, Ron bought Neverland in December 2020 for a reported $22 million. So there you have it, there's a lot of buzz going around that Clive Davis and Ron Burkle might be two of the main reasons why Diddy has been acting untouchable all these years. And fans are saying that this all makes sense because the amount of disturbing allegations that came out about Diddy over the past few months is the only reason he still hasn't been officially investigated and it's probably because because he's got some extremely powerful people watching his back, no pun intended. And you know the streets have been talking all about it. The streets have been saying that billionaire is protecting Diddy. That is why nobody is speaking out. They aren't afraid of Diddy. They're afraid of his handler. Diddy is a billionaire's boy toy. Another person added, Clive Davis is 91, he a little too old. Yeah, Ron makes more sense. But I've got to know what y'all think about this. There's a whole lot of tea coming out about Diddy's rumored sugar daddies, but what do y'all think about that Michael Jackson connection? Do you think that there's more than meets the eye, or are folks reading too much into it? Drop your thoughts in comments below, and then check out this next video.